pastoring in 2017 and went into kind of a specialty ministry and traveling throughout the country presenting Christ-centered, faith-based counseling and uh, healing for people that are struggling with various types of things. I worked for the Collin County Sheriff's Office for nine years and there I helped our officers as well as the inmate population deal with trauma and trauma recovery. And so I met these wonderful people at Narrow Trail Cowboy Church and they have been so gracious uh, to have Donna and I over and over again. Every time we leave on a Sunday I say, Dear Lord, I sure hope they have us back. And I know they're going to have my wife back. Don't away with everybody over there. <laughs> and uh, we're still feeding back a little bit. And if you want to know anything about me, my sister is over here. And she pretty well raised me, so she can tell you all the things that you probably won't know. Right now, we're in a series on spiritual warfare. Purposely doing this. Because as a psychologist and a counselor, Christian counselor, Christian psychologist, he says, is there such a thing? Yes, there is. I'm one of them. <laughs> I have the opportunity to work with a lot of people that are really struggling with all kinds of things uh, that is complexing their world. Uh, if you have not figured this out, uh, we are under a spiritual attack like probably we have never seen before. If you read your Bible, and I know you have, you know that the devil understands that his days are short. It doesn't take much to look around in our society today and to see the influence and the workings of Satan upon the lives of individuals. Now his main goal is to seek out, to destroy, and to annihilate those that, live, that are created in the image of God living on planet Earth. Now whether you believe the devil is real or not, uh, that's your own personal uh, belief, but I will tell you, the Bible teaches that He's real. The Bible teaches that we are in a spiritual warfare. The Bible teaches that there is wickedness in high places, principalities, rulers of darkness, which are demons. So if the Bible teaches it, I am led to believe it's the truth. And last week, we talked about the belt of truth. Uh, in this spiritual warfare in the book of Ephesians, if you're following us, you will find this over in Ephesians chapter 6 where the Apostle Paul is writing this dynamic church about how they need to equip themselves and arm themselves with the whole armor of God in order that they might be able to stand against the schemes, the devices of Satan. So we end up this chapter in verse 10, and there's a word in the Greek, he says, finally, simply bringing the thought to a conclusion, saying, let me just nail this down, let me tell you for a fact, there is a spiritual warfare. And he says, finally, I need to tell you this. You need to be strong in the Lord. Now, I know we're going back and rehearsing this a little bit more, but there's a lot of new people here today. The main key to fighting spiritual battle is to know your weaknesses and know how to get stronger. If you know your weaknesses spiritually, that's a good thing, because that's a good place to start. You say, I'm prone to get into pornography. Well, it's time to realize that is a demonic influence that is entering into your life. So therefore, if you know that, you say, I've got to break this stronghold. I've got to get strong enough where I don't click that on my computer or on my phone, that I get where my thoughts are pure, my intents are pure, my relationship with my wife and family is right, and it'll never be right if you're hooked into that stuff. Right. So here we go. He says, you need to be strong. That word strong has to do with working out. You know, if we don't work out physically, we get weak. It's the same thing spiritually. If we don't continuously, perpetually grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, what will end up happening is we'll become weak as a Christian. We'll lose our strength to resist the schemes and the wiles of the devil. And all of a sudden, he'll throw a snare, a demon will throw a trap, a demon will get on your shoulder and lead you into unrighteousness. Be strong in the Lord. Our first sermon we did, we said, here's the key to being strong in the Lord. Number one, making sure that you know Christ as your personal Savior. If you're saved today, say amen. amen. If you're not saved today, before you leave, get that way. Amen? amen? The first thing is having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Say, what does that mean? That means at some point in time in your life, in my life, I realized that I was a sinner. That simply means that I knew I was wrong, and I knew my... He's working, those guys. There he is. 
interrogated somewhere. I knew that I could not save myself. Matter of fact, I'll just be frank with you, I had an alcohol addiction. I had a drug addiction, married to a wonderful Christian lady, sliding down the slope of sand into the cesspool of destruction. And let me tell you something, God got a hold of my life and showed me I couldn't straighten myself up. How many of you think you've got to get straight before you can get to God? That's a lie. You come to Him exactly the way you are, just as I am without one plea. I came to Christ and I said, I can't save myself. I'm a rotten, dirty sinner. If you can help me, I'd appreciate it. Right there on the spot, I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. And let me tell you what happened. He imputed into me righteousness. What is righteousness? It's right living. It's the Spirit of God that leads us and directs us and guides us to live the right way. So you see, the first thing we have here is the truth. Now the truth is God's Word. It's established and it's settled in heaven. It doesn't matter what I think the truth is. It doesn't matter honestly what you think the truth is. The truth is rooted and grounded in God Himself. And if you want to find the truth, the Bible says, My Word is true. If you want to see the Word become flesh, Jesus said, I am the truth, the life, the resurrection, and no man will come to the Father except by me. Can I have somebody Amen. say something? Amen. 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 you got a world teaching a bunch of lies that there are many avenues to salvation. Well, Jesus said, I am the. And that word simply means the only way to salvation. And that's good news for this world. But the bad news is all the false doctrines and false prophets that go around saying, you know, you can do good works. And finally, when you get to heaven one of these, or if it's purgatory, wherever you might believe it is, and things way outright, you can go to heaven. I'm going to tell you, the Bible doesn't teach that. That's right. There's one way to heaven, and it's through His Son, Jesus. And so that's the truth of the matter. And Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth can set you free. Take somebody that's addicted to drugs. You know, they say, well, I want to quit. That's a good thing. That's a great thing and a good place to start. But how come they can't quit? I'm going to give you the answer to that in just a moment. So we have, first of all, truth established with God. Now notice the next thing it says here. He says, uh, the place. We're for taking you the whole armor of God, verse 13, that you might be able to stand against the evil day, having done all to stand. Now watch this. Stand, therefore, having your lawns. This is the belt of truth. Having on the breast plate of righteousness. Now this morning I was kind of thinking over the message and everything that I prepared throughout the week. And I looked at a breastplate. You know, I was thinking, you know, this breastplate that Paul must be talking about has a big R in the middle of it for righteousness. And then the Lord began to show me, what about Superman? Well, he don't have a breastplate, but he's got a costume that has a big ass on it, right? That identifies who he is, Superman. I'm going to tell you, the costume does not make Superman Superman. What makes Superman is Superman. He's still Superman without the costume on or not. But just think about this breastplate that you need to put on. It is a piece of armor that you ought to wear every single day of your life, and it's called righteousness. And what is righteousness? It's God's standard based upon the truth. It's God's standard predicated by the truth. That's what righteousness is. Now, friend, our righteousness before Christ is nothing but dirty, filthy rags. Right. But when you and I got saved, what God did, He took the righteousness of Christ and He put it into our account. When the Spirit of God came to live inside of me, it brought with that the righteousness of God. Right. Now, I don't understand this. I've studied the Bible for 40 years, but I believe it. When I received Christ as my, my personal Savior, I was justified. That's another word for righteousness. And the word justified simply means just as though I have not. Now think about this. All the dirty, rotten sin that we've all done, the moment we received Christ as our personal Savior, we were justified. The judge declared us righteous in his own sight. Why did he do that? Because on the cross of Calvary, God imputed all of the sin of the world upon Jesus. He took your sin, my sin, future, past, present, all of the sin that the entire world will ever do, and He put it on His Son and He nailed it to the cross. When I received Christ as my Savior, He gave me the righteousness of God, Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible teaches you in the New Testament that when the Comforter has come, He will come into our heart. What will He do? He will lead us. He will guide us what? In what? The truth. So this breastplate of righteousness, it's a personal identification 
that I am to wear. But it's something more than wearing this breastplate. It's being who I say that Christ has made me. This may come a shock to some of you, but listen carefully. When God saved you, He only saved one-third of you. Are you with me? He only saved one-third of you. He didn't save your body. Because one of these days it's going to give up. Matter of fact, it's dying right now. This is sure you're sitting here and I'm standing here. I tell you what else He didn't save. He didn't save your mind, your soul. Hold on, wait a minute. We used to sing this song. He saved my soul. No, He didn't. Because your soul is your mind and your intellect. That's still as fleshly as it's ever been. Amen. And if it doesn't get control and you don't submit yourself to God, such as the book of James says, it will consume you and you'll start living not a righteous life, but with a big U, unrighteous life. I'll tell you what He did. He saved your spirit. That's what He did. The Spirit of God came to live inside of you. He's here. Can I have an amen? amen. amen. He's here. I don't understand it. I've preached it for years and years. I still don't understand. But I don't have to understand something to believe it as long as it's written in this book. Amen? Amen. So what's the problem? Are you ready for this? It's called imparted righteousness. Now Paul's talking about the breastplate of righteousness. He's not talking about imputed righteousness here. He's talking about imparted righteousness. Now what's imparted righteousness? It's information given and received. Information given and received. Now think those decision. We're almost done here. They only give me 20 minutes. But I told him, I said, that's okay, 20 minutes is fine because you used to do a radio program for KLTY. And I'll tell you something right now. I had 25 minutes and that, but they shut it off. I got a call one time from the radio producer, Easy Ezel. He said, Brother Kilberman, now, uh, you're kind of going a little long right there. We've got commercials to do. I said, I'll make sure you shut it off. So right here is Dave Keller, and he goes like this when it's time to quit. <laughs> Imputed righteousness. When you read the book of Ephesians, and you realize what this is all about, it's about God imparting to you and I knowledge. Knowledge that only your spirit and my spirit, which is the spirit of God, is set up to receive. Okay? So what is the problem when we get ourselves as a Christian living an unrighteous life? What's happened? What's happened that we cannot stop lying? What's happened that we cannot stop being consumed by the things of this world? Greed? Money? I know a lot of men that the only thing they can worship is money. And by the way, I say this in teaching. If you're worried about money all the time, money is probably your God. Amen? Because you don't have enough. Yeah, you do. you got enough for today, right? Somebody? Amen. It's all you were promised right now. Give us this day our daily bread. So what happens to us? What is it that we just simply can't have victory in the spiritual realm of battle? Why is it that we can't be full of the joy of the Lord? Why is it that we're always drugged down into the muck and the mire and worry and worry until we're sick? You ready for the answer? You're rejecting imparted knowledge. What you doing? We got any professional warriors here? Do you like it? I saw that game. If it wasn't for worrying, you'd have nothing to do. You know what the opposite of meditating on the scripture is? It's called worry. Now watch this. Something's happening and you start worrying. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your health. We all have different things. Maybe it's a child, maybe it's a wife, maybe it's a husband, a grandparent, a mom, a dad. And you worry all day long, and you come home and you lay down and you keep worrying. And you worry, and you worry, and you worry, and you worry, until you can't sleep and you toss and turn, and you get up the next day and you're still worrying. Am I getting there yet? Watch this. Imparted righteousness. Be you anxious for nothing. Simply don't worry about anything. 
but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will what? Keep your heart and your mind. So here we have inside of us the Spirit of God. It can receive that. Why? Because it's God's truth. And what we have to do is keep pushing that down into our spirit. Pushing it and pushing it and pushing it and pushing it until finally it becomes the way of life. In our home, we just simply don't worry. Why? Because God said not to. You say, is it that simple? This is important. Righteousness. But see, bottom line is this. When the Spirit gets in control, y'all ready for this? And imparted righteousness begins to consume your life. For my God shall supply all of my needs according to His riches in Christ Jesus. And that begins to capture your soul because you keep pushing it down. And pushing it down. This is what happened. The Spirit says to the mind, buddy, you need to be thinking this way. And the mind says to the body, you need to think this way and act this way. Are you following me now? That's how it happens. Imparted righteousness. You say, I just can't get it. That's because you're not packing it in. Now watch what David says. David says, I hide. You know what that word hide means in the Hebrew? I pack it. In my heart. What? The Word of God that I might not sin against Him. He hangs on to it. Read Psalm 119 and look how many times David refers to the Word of God to the commandments of God, to the statutes of God, over and over and over again. If you have trouble loving God's Word, let me challenge you to get home to Psalm 119. Get on your knees and don't get up until God gives you a love for His Word. Ooh, that's pretty good question. Not because I said it. We can't get it. You ready? Book of James. James talks about a mirror. Doesn't he? And he tells us that we go to a mirror to see how we look. Are you ready? Now here's something for a fact. None of you know what you look like unless you see a reflection of who you are. Right? But I'm going to tell you something about the ladies here today. They spent a whole lot of time from that mirror this morning. Can I have an amen? <laughs> you know what they were doing? Oh, I got one. We lived in a, in a RV for a while. When I first retired, we wanted to travel. And we had an ice room. It only had one bathroom. But, oh, dear God. <laughs> I sold it so we had two bathrooms. I ain't getting in there. Come on, ladies. you will make sure everything is in place. Now, us guys, we go to that mirror. Ugh. Come over here and turn around and walk off. But the lady keeps going back and back and back and back. Come on, somebody testify. Until it's right. But it's the reflection of who you are that shows you who you are. You ready? This is a mirror. When I stand before it, and I say it says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And I look at myself in this mirror. It tells me, not what I look at look like on the outside, but what I look like down here. That's right. Amen. Are we getting it so far? We are, aren't we? But I'm gonna tell you something. The breastplate of righteousness is to be war every day to remind us that we have a standard by which we must live predicated upon the Word of God. A standard, not that we set, but a standard that God has set. Now, if I were to say to one of you, David Keller, my buddy, David, in your backyard, or y'all were asleep last night, I buried one hundred thousand dollars. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> when I say Amen in just a moment, he gonna get up. Pack that camera up. He ain't going to say nothing to nobody. <laughs> he ain't going to shake anybody's hand. 
He ain't gonna say, God bless you, brother, see you next week. He's gonna hit that fence out there, get in that car, go home. And the first thing he's gonna he ain't even gonna bother to change into different clothes. He's gonna get a shovel. <laughs> Come on! And he's gonna get out there in that backyard and he's gonna dig that puppy up until he finds that hundred thousand dollars. No matter how much he tears up or how deep he digs, he's gonna keep going until he gets it. Come on. This is much more valuable Woo! than anything on planet Earth. There are two things that are eternal in this room. The souls of men and the Word of God. Amen. If you knew what was in this book and you practiced it, your life would be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The reason there is no transformation, my friend, because there's no digging. Mm. But this is the key to victory over spiritual warfare. Not only having the truth imputed, but having the truth imparted. Where it gets down into the spirit of my life. And it says, love my wife and live with her according to knowledge. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Big John. Man, we used to go to church back when I first got saved. We'd walk into Sunday school. I'm done. Butch White would say, y'all been fighting. How did he know? Thought all the way to church. Y'all been fighting. He'd pull me aside and said, what he'd say? Skip, you'd love your wife like Christ loved the church. And he said, that means unconditionally. And that's seeded in my spirit. And it's been over 45 years since he told me that. Get in this book. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Protect your heart from unrighteousness. Don't play with sin. Because sin will take you further than you want to go. And it will cost you more than you want to spend. Can we bow our head in prayer this morning? Is there someone here today that is not 100% for sure that salvation is a part of your life, that Jesus is your Savior? And if your life ended today, you know exactly where you spend eternity in heaven. But is there someone here today that says, I don't know that. I'm not for sure that if my life ended today, that I would be with Jesus. Can you slip your hand up and put it right back down? Does anybody like that? I'll look around just a moment, then I'll move right on. I'm not for sure, but I'm saved. Anybody like that? Anyone else? Right here? Anyone else? Okay, for those of you who raise your hand, I want you to know this. God loves you. He sent His Son Jesus to die for you on Calvary's cross. And on that cross, He paid for your sin. He is offering you right now forgiveness and eternal life in His righteousness. He loves you. He's proven it. And all you have to do is open the door of your heart and let Him in. God, I'd like to lead you in this prayer. Right where you sit, would you pray this prayer if you ask it to be saved today? Dear Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. I accept you into my heart right now. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin and be my Lord and my Savior and my God. And one day when I die, Jesus, take me to heaven to be with you. If you prayed that prayer and you meant that from the bottom of your heart, would you just slip your hand up and say, I prayed that prayer and invited Christ in my life. Anyone like me? Thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate you. May God bless you. And, uh, thank you, Merrill Trump Capital Church. It's a great day. Please be careful going home. Mr. Keller, is there any... Nothing?